Hi, welcome to lecture one in our Bayesian statistics course. So in this lecture, we're going to do a review of classical inference. I'm going to introduce you to some new concepts that even if you've had a stats course before, you may not have covered. And that will help us on our journey to begin to understand the language and the basics of Bayesian statistics here in the next few lectures. So to give us a working example to go through today, I wanted to start with something that has become a, a bit of a classic story in the literature. So our guiding example is one about testing claims of therapeutic touch. Now I'll talk a little bit about what that means here to, just by way of introducing the example, but you can learn a lot about this whole story by Googling the name Emily Rosa. And this was kind of a fun story in the 90s. Of, I think at this point, Emily is still the youngest person ever to have a peer-reviewed scientific article uh, published. I think she was 11 when this happened. So the background is this. Um, there are practitioners of therapeutic touch who claim to be able to feel a human energy field uh, from their patients. And they use this, uh, this ability to feel to manipulate these energy fields and do some sorts of uh, uh, holistic healing or whatever. And Emily, uh, being a child skeptic, set up a fourth grade science fair project to test these claims of therapeutic touch. And we're actually going to look at some of that data today uh, and begin talking about scientific inference with that data. So to begin, let's describe Emily's experiment. So in the experiment, you can see a picture down here. Um, you can see that uh, behind, the, so the, the therapeutic touch TT uh, practitioner is set up behind an occlusion screen and they put their arms through here and then the experimenters on the other side of this screen. And the idea is that the experimenter randomly selects one of the practitioner's hands and holds her hand above it. So you can see in this diagram, the experimenter is holding her hand slightly above the practitioner's right hand. Now, of course, again, this is all included behind the screen. So the, ther the therapeutic touch practitioner solely has to identify which hand the experimenter has selected, you know, is hovering uh, her hand above by this supposed human energy field and use these powers to identify. Okay, so it's actually a quite clever experiment. Now, as you might guess, the results were a little bit mixed. So in uh, Emily Rosa's experiment, practitioners were only correct on 44% of the experimental trials. She did a bunch of them. I think we'll see in a little while she did 280 trials. So our goal today is to evaluate the practitioner's claims, this idea that they can feel this human energy field. Do these data support such a claim? And we will learn how to answer that question today. So to do that, of course, we are going to use inferential statistics. To begin our review of inferential statistics, uh, something you've probably already covered in some extent somewhere, I'm going to use a conceptual framework that I introduced in my uh, recent uh, book, Psychological Statistics, The Basics. And so this is, this is my diagram. And the idea is that um, inferential statistics works by uncovering things that we couldn't see before. So for example, this little triangle that's popping out, it's making the invisible visible by uh, bounding it by three ideas, right? We want to first describe observed data. We want to then define statistical models of that data. And then finally, we want to do some estimation and comparison of those models. Now, what makes that a framework that's worth talking about for this type of problem? Well, let's look exactly at that. First of all, uh, describing the observed data, we just did that. Uh, we said that the, the practitioners were correct only on 44% of the trial, so that's the observed data. Now we have to have something by which to understand what that data says for us. So the next step, of course, is to, uh, let's see if I can find the thing here. The next step is to define the statistical models, and that's, of course, what we're going to review in this lecture. 
And then finally, the model comparison and estimation part, uh, well, there are two methods for this. There's one that's classical inference. This is probably what you know a little bit about already, especially if you know what hypothesis testing means. And then there's the method you're going to learn about in this course, which is Bayesian model comparison. So using this, uh, this, this idea, we can then decide or we can at least get some uh, inference on whether the practitioner's claims uh, have any merit to them. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, so let's begin by talking about what a model is. What is, what, I mean, what, what is a model? So in this course, uh, we're going to look at a model as a mathematical function that links some latent population variables to observable data. So I've got a picture of this here. And by the way, by mathematical function, I almost always in this course will mean a probability distribution. What all this is will become clear as we work through our examples today. Here's the visualization. And I'm gonna uh, shrink this down just a little bit so that we can see it all in one screen. So the, the idea is that up here in this sort of unseeable realm, that's why I put it in this little cloud, these are the population parameters. These are the things I want to know about. They're latent because they can't be observed, but they somehow govern what's happening down here in the real world on the ground, okay? So you've, 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 you've undoubtedly looked at the difference between population and sample before. That's kind of what I'm getting at here. So a model, is simply the object or the thing which links these unseeable things that I want to know about to the things I can actually see, that is data. Model is the link between the two. So what does that mean in this context? Well, in this context, uh, our observable data, of course, is just the um, number of successes out of some set of experimental trials, right? Uh, we know that in the Emily Rosa experiment, they were the practitioners were correct on 44% of these trials. So if that was 100 trials, that means we would have 44 successes. And what we are really interested in is how likely people are, these practitioners are, to be correct on each of the trials. Okay. So the population parameter that we might be interested in is that probability. It's that latent probability of getting a success on a trial. Now I'm going to call these, to, you know, to, to make the mathematics simple, I'm going to give these ideas uh, letters to the state in their, in, their, uh, in their place. So for the observable data that I see, I'm going to always re re uh, call that an X. And then for this parameter up here, for this probability of getting a success on each trial, I'm going to call that W. Okay. Now, is there something that can link the probability of getting success on a single trial to the number of successes that I would predict out of a full set of trials? And the answer is yes. And that object, that link between those two concepts is what's called the binomial model. Now, this is likely a new concept uh, to many of you, although at, at its core, these are probably things you have dealt with in various contexts before. But I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what the binomial model is, and then I'm going to show you how to use one of our computational tools, R, to uh, do some computation with the binomial model. So what is a binomial model? Well, basically it's this. The binomial model says for a given probability of success, W, Right, so this is that probability of success on each trial. The binomial model gives us the probability of observing X successes out of a set of N trials. Okay. Now let's do an example to uh, try to make this a little bit more clear. So let's just suppose for simplicity that we have N equals 10 trials total. Okay. And let's also suppose that the probability of success on each trial is 0.25. Right. The probability has to be a number between 0 and 1, where 0 never happens and 1 always happens. So 0.25 is literally a 1 in 4 chance, okay. 1 out of 4. The question is, what is the probability of observing x equals 8 successes? Okay. So this is the type of problem that you might have dealt with in a college algebra course or some similar uh, early freshman math course before. So let's see if we can work through it. And then we'll discover that the binomial model actually is tailor-made to answer this question directly and do more. 
So first of all, let's look conceptually. If you've got 10 trials, the 10 trials, the way this experiment is set up, are, they all have to be one of two things. They either have to be a success or a failure. Right? There's no in-between, right? You either get the right hand selected, yes or no, or you don't, right? You get the wrong one. And so for these data, for x equals 8 successes, this would look like out of a set of 10 trials, 8 of them are successes, 2 of them are failures. So one way that that might look is just as a string of success, 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 8 times, followed by 2 failures. Okay, so that's one possible way to observe 8 successes and 2 failures. Now, the probability of that happening, well, these are all independent trials. So the probability of a success is 0.25, right? That's, that was given to us in the original problem statement. And if we've got independent events, we simply multiply the probabilities each time. 0.25 times 0.25. We do that eight times. Now, what about the failures? Well, success is the opposite of a failure, right? So if the probability of success is 0.25, the probability of failure has to be 1 minus that, 0.75. 25% like sure it's going to happen means 75% sure it's not going to happen. So the probability of a failure, 0.75 times 0.75. So in all, if I want to just compact this a little bit, I've got 0.25 to the eighth power, like this, and 0.75 to the squared power, to the, to the second power. So that's the probability of observing that sequence. Eight successes followed by two failures. But now we have to consider that this isn't the whole story, right? This is not the only way that we could get eight successes and two failures, right? We could have a failure and then eight successes and then a failure. Or we could have the two failures interspersed at any point in between from beginning to end. So there's a lot of different ways to intersperse those two failures in those ten trials. So I want to be able to count how many of those ways there are, how many of those arrangements there are. And the way we do that may be familiar to you. If not, it's called a combination. Let me write that down real quick. In mathematics, the notion of a combination is the following thing. It's this notion of taking 10 things and choosing eight of them, asking how many ways are there to do that. And again, from some early math course, you may have seen this before, the number of ways to choose eight things from ten objects is given to us by this uh, ten factorial over two factorial times eight factorial, right? The idea is you take whatever the number of things you have factorial divided by the number of things you're choosing times the number of things that are left. And if I work this out, now, by the way, if you're already freaking out that you've got to know this, don't worry. We're never going to actually do these, com these, these computations by ourselves. We'll actually let our studio do them. But I want you to see where they come from. If we were to actually carry out this, uh, this mathematics, it's actually not too bad. Because these are all multiplications going on here, here's the 10 factorial. right? Factorial means 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 all the way down to 1. And here's the 8 factorial. And here's the 2 factorial, I can actually divide a lot of these out. In fact, everything from 8 on down will cancel out with its corresponding term in the denominator. Okay. Which just leaves me with 10 times 9 divided by 2, which is 45. Okay. So it turns out that this is one of those 8 success, 2 failure sequences. There's 44 more, right? There's 45 total ways to get eight successes. Now, why do we need to know that? Well, because this is the probability of getting one of those ways. I need to multiply that by 45. So in the end, to find the probability of getting eight successes, okay, which I would write this way, I take that 10 choose eight times the thing that I did earlier, and I get this number. Now, if you wonder where that number came from, here, I'll show you. I did it on my calculator. But I'll about to show you how to do it in R. Okay. But the point is, this is a very small number. This is very not very likely to occur. Okay. Not very likely to occur at all. So I claim that you can do these computations in R. So let's do that real quickly. I'm going to bring up R Studio onto the screen. Apparently I have it hidden down here, so give me just one second. Sorry, I've lost my mouse. 
Almost got it. There's a little tricky thing to it here. Hang on, I'm going to pause the video real quick, and then we'll bring our studio back up. Okay, took me a minute. My mouse was not working like I wanted it to, but I now have our studio up here. So, our studio in the in lecture zero, right before this, you hopefully got our studio installed on your computer. Now we're actually going to use it. Now, as I mentioned in that video, your R Studio may look a little bit different from mine. For example, R Studio typically has a white background instead of this uh, interesting little um, kind of this is called a solarized light background that I have. So these are all just things that I change to make them easier on my eyes and make make it customized to the way that I like to do things. But one thing that I do like to to do in R Studio is arrange my panes in my in the in the editor so that they look like this. So you'll see that I've got my script over here, okay? So this is lecture1.r. This is actually on Canvas for you to download and then go open in R Studio using the open file command. So I encourage you to do that because it'll have all the commands we need already in it. And then I like to put my console over here. This is the part that you can actually interact with. You can say 2 plus 3 equals 5. There's all kinds of things. X squared is, well, X is not anything, but how about 5 squared is 25, etc. And then when we do some plots, they're going to show up down here. Okay. So what I just got through claiming is that we could do this computation right here, this, um, this binomial, you know, number of a probability of eight successes out of ten trials, that we could do that in R. So I want to show you how to do that real quick. And the way we do it is we type some commands in. Now, if I, I can type everything by hand in just this window right here, but that's not very efficient because then I have to retype stuff all the time. And if I come back tomorrow, I might not remember what I typed. That's a little bit annoying, quite frankly. So what I like to do is keep things in a script, something like this over here, this, this lecture1.r file that you've downloaded. And now, if you look at line 7, you can see that I've got all the components of that calculation all in line here. I've got choose 10, uh, comma 8. What is that? Well, that's that 10 choose 8 function. This is just how R, uh, this is the R function for, for doing that. Times 0.25 to the 8 times 0.75 squared, okay? So when I type in a command like that in a script, I can send it from the script to the console by hitting control return, okay? So that's what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna say control return, and it's gonna send that um, computation in here, and it's gonna give me the answer. And you can look back at our notes, that's exactly the same answer that we just saw, 0 .000386. Let's check that real quick. Boom, there it is, 0 .000386. So that's kind of cool, right? The idea is that RStudio will do these computations for us. Now, one of the things I also want to mention is that R will do this computation without you having to know the formula for computations. It uses that binomial model. So what you see in line 10 is something that we'll use a little bit in the next lecture, but it will do the exact same thing. It's called D binom. Uh, D stands for density. And you'll see, uh, of course, binom is for binomial. You'll see that the ingredients of this function, the things I'm plugging into it, are the problem parameters that I had a second ago. X equals 8, that's your data. Size equals 10, that's the size of the, uh, of the string. And then prob equals 0.25, that's the W, right? That's the probability of success on each trial. So if I send that to the console, if I say control enter, you can see I get exactly the same answer. So that's pretty cool because I can use that as a function that I can then do over and over again, especially if I wanted to do some plotting, okay? Which, uh, which we will do in just a second. Okay. So you may be wondering, how does this binomial model even work as a model? What is it that makes it a model? So let's take a look at that for a second. So remember, a model uh, from our earlier earlier lecture, or part of the lecture today, is the thing which links the stuff in the population that I want to know about to the observable data. Okay. So what exactly does that look like here? Well, 
And at the top, stuff I want to know about, I want to know what is, you know, I want to know the probability of success on each trial. So the model works here by starting with a value for W. In our example, we had 0.25, right? And then what the model will do is it will generate potential data that could be observed. Uh, these are not, this is not a certainty that you're going to observe A, but it's going to tell you out of all the possibilities of what you could observe, here's the relative likelihoods of them occurring, right? This is the potential data that could be observed. Okay? So what that means is it would be really helpful if we could somehow plot or visualize this potential data. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So I'm going to pop back over to RStudio and show you how to plot some potential data. Okay. So let's do that. Let's plot some potential data from the model parameters. So the way this is done, I have already put it into the script, is we're going to do a bar plot where we're going to use that binomial function density. Okay. I'll change this to 0.25 real quick. Okay. We're going to use uh, that function inside the bar plot function of R, and we're actually going to get a nice visualization of our potential data. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, describe what these two lines, 13 and 14, are. 13 uh, just says, let's make, um, let's, let's make our inputs to the function go from 0 to 10 and go up by 1. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. You know, this is, these are the numbers of successes that I could get in this, in, in this experiment. 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 10. All right? And then the bar plot is going to be on all those probabilities of the x's where the probability on each trial of success on each trial is 0.25. And then, of course, I put some labels in here. So let's execute all of that code, this code chunk from line 13 through 17. I'm going to highlight all that, and then I'm going to hit Control Return. It's going to take just a second here, but it's going to plot a plot here for us. Okay. Now, to see this plot, uh, it's probably behind my picture right now, so I'm going to scoot it around just a little bit so that you can see it. And you can see here, by this plot, that the most likely data that I would see, you remember the data are the number of successes out of 10 trials, the most likely data that I'm going to see is, you know, anywhere around 2, 1, 3, 4, sometimes 0. I'm certainly hardly ever going to see 8, 9, 10 successes, right? So the most likely data is here. That's potential data, right? This tells you something about what you can expect if the probability on each trial is 0.25. Now, what if I change that to 0.75? Okay. I can easily, again, just execute all of this code, and I will update my plot, as you see. So again, just control enter. Okay. Hang on one second. So now you can see that when I put the probability of success on each trial as something bigger, 0.75, the data that I would expect to generate is up here. Okay, it's, it's up around six successes, seven, eight, the most likely, it looks like eight successes, nine, ten. Okay. In other words, large values of, of data are much more likely in this case. Okay. So hopefully you can see that what I'm getting from a model, let's go back to here, is I'm starting with a hypothetical value for W for this probability of success on each trial, and I'm generating a whole set of potential data that could be observed, you know, getting information about what I should be able to expect. So that's all well and good. But the problem of inference is reverse of that. Okay. The problem of inference is not what data can you expect given a parameter, it's actually the opposite. If I have some data, what is the parameter that generated that? Let me show you the picture of what that would look like. After you do some research, right, you collect some data. So let's suppose that we've done that. Let's suppose that we observed eight successes in 10 trials. Now the question is what is the value of the parameter W? What is W? This is the opposite, right? It's still using the model because the model is linking these two ideas. 
but this is different. Before, the model went this way, right? The model went from down, from top to bottom. Now, the model is going from bottom to top. And this is the classic problem of, in, of inference. So to solve this, let's do a little bit of playing around in R and see what we can come up with. So I'm going to go back, show the full screen. So you can see I've walked you through in the script what we can do. So again, let's suppose that we observe the eight successes. But this time, we're going to plot the possible values of the parameter on the x-axis. So I'm going to call those Ws. And they have to go from 0 to 1 because they're probabilities, right? And I'm going to go up by a very small amount so that I get a bunch of these values. And then I'm going to use those Ws along with those binomial probabilities. But this time, the probabilities are not fixed. The probabilities are going to range from 0 to 1. The data is fixed this time. Okay, and then again, I'll put some, put some labels on here. Let's just see what this looks like. So again, highlight this whole code chunk. And we'll get a plot. And let me move it over to here where we can see it. And what you'll see is instead of a bar plot like we had this time, you get a smooth plot. Now, is that because I just made a different type of plot? Well, no. It's because we're actually looking at a fundamentally different question. Before, the question was, if I fix the value of the parameter, what's the data? Well, the data has to be a count. The data has to be the number of successes. That can only be 0, 1, 2, up to 10. Now the question is backwards. If I fix the data, I saw eight successes. What's the value of the parameter? The parameter is a probability value. It could be anything from zero to one, fractions included, right? And so that's why we have a smooth plot now. Now one of the things that you'll notice is that it is at its highest right here over 0 0.8. 0 0.8, of course, is the same as eight out of 10. So this is what's called the maximum of the likelihood function, or sometimes called maximum likelihood estimate. So this is the most likely value for the parameter w. But we don't know that it is the parameter's value. We just know it's the most likely one. So of course, we have some estimation going on here, and we have some, uh, we have some variability. We have some uncertainty. So this is what's called a likelihood function. It's a slightly different idea, but it kind of shows us where we're headed, right? It gives us some way to look at the problem of inference when we're given the data and we're asked what's the most likely value that produced that data. Okay. So the problem of inference, let me reclassify all this. The problem of inference is that we are given data and then we ask what is or are the values of the model parameters that could have generated it. Now from above, we can see that there's going to be some uncertainty with respect to those parameter values. Again, look at the, look at the graph. I, I drug it into my notes earlier, but look at the graph here, right? This is the maximum likelihood. We're, this is the most likely value for W, it's 0.8. That makes sense if it was eight out of 10 trials. But I mean, there's some positive likelihood to be anywhere between 0.6 and one. Even down here as far as 0.4, there's some positive likelihood going on. So because of this uncertainty, we need to be able to get a handle on it. And Bayesian statistics is exactly how we're going to do this. It's going to provide us with a comprehensive way to quantify this uncertainty and factor it in to our inference. And of course, we'll do this more in lecture two. So to finish up our review, let's talk about model comparison because uh, we've looked, you know, if we look at, go way back in the lecture, sorry for the background noise, my fan on my computer is kicked on, it's rather warm in here right now. If we go back to this diagram, this framework of inferential statistics, you know, of course we described our observed data, now we've defined a model. We've defined a binomial model at this point, we want to do the third part, which is the estimation and model comparisons. So we're going to focus on the model comparison today. So what is model comparison? Well, it's something you've seen before. You may have seen it called hypothesis testing. So let's remember how that works. So step one in model comparison or hypothesis testing is that we set up two models or hypotheses. And classically, the way we do this is we set up a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis in this scenario 
would be that, you know, there's nothing going on. That is, the performance is based purely on guessing. It's based on chance performance alone. And the alternative hypothesis, this should support the research question. The research question is, you know, is there therapeutic touch going on? Well, if that was the case, then performance would be better than guessing. So I'm going to set that up as my alternative hypothesis. Now, the thing about these is verbal hypotheses are fine, but we want mathematically specified hypotheses. So the way we do that is we set them up like this. We'll call this one H0. And if performance is based on guessing, then that would mean that W, the probability of success on every trial, is 50-50. It's 50% 50 or 0.5. So this gives us a nice specification of the null hypothesis. Similarly, the alternative hypothesis we would write as H1, where W is greater than 0.5. And then once we've done that, our goal, our goal is to compare the models. We want to know which one best predicts the observed data. Now the classical method for this goes all the way, actually goes like a long way, but was really popularized by, uh, by, by Fisher in the 20s. And it works this way. Again, you've seen this before. Assume that the null hypothesis is true. Then calculate the probability of observing your data or more extreme under this assumption. So what does that mean? Well, that means the following. Okay. It means we want to compute the probability of some data given that the null is true. In this case, that means we want to get the probability that x is, and let me fix this, this is actually x is bigger than or equal to 8, given that w, the probability of success on each trial, is 0.5. And believe it or not, this is a p-value. This is exactly what we mean when we talk about p-values in statistics. It's the probability of observing your data, or more extreme, that's the greater than or equal to part, under the assumption of the null hypothesis. So we can compute this using R because we know how to make computations on the binomial model using R. So let's pop over there to R. Okay. So first of all, we want to know what the probability is of getting 8 or 9 or 10 successes if W equals 0.5. So let's actually draw the probability distribution for probability of 0.5. Okay, so we're going to use this chunk of code. This is just the same chunk of code as above, but I changed to 0.5 to reflect the null. So I'll do control return. And so you can see these are the potential data under the null hypothesis. The, uh, let me move it where you can actually see it now. These are the potential data under the null, right? In fact, if the null is true, the probability on each trial is 0.5. That means most likely we would see around five successes, five out of 10, right? And as you get away from that, the probability goes down each time. Now the p-value, remember this, the p-value is exactly the probability of getting our observed data, which was eight, or bigger, nine or 10, under this assumption. So we actually have a picture of this already that we can make this calculation from. Let's look at it in our lecture notes, okay? The p-value is precisely the probability of getting eight or nine or 10. It's these three bars added together. It's the height of those three bars. It's those three probabilities. Now the way we'll get this probability in R is actually pretty easy. <clears throat> We're going to use something called the p-binom function. Again, don't worry, notice, okay, let me back up. You've seen this sort of before, we saw a d-binom. Well, p-binom is again, it's the binomial model, but this time instead of a single probability, it's going to give us everything up to a certain point. Now what I want is this part right here, so I actually need to compute this part and take one minus it. Okay, so when you look in R in just a second, let me, in fact, let me go ahead and show you what the command looks like on the lecture notes. It's going to look like this right here. It's going to look like one minus P binom of seven. Okay, because it's basically everything, it's, it's this stuff and what's left over. Okay, so since I want this, I'm going to take one minus all that. So that's what this is. Let's do it in R just real quick. So that's line 53 here, control return. That's going to give me 0 0.054, so around 0 0.05, right? 
So that means the probability of observing eight successes or nine or 10 under the null is around 5%. Now, of course, you know, uh, hopefully, what the story here is then, if this happens, right? In this case, the p-value is small, it's around 0.05, which means that the observed data that we saw is actually quite rare under the null hypothesis. Now, the null hypothesis means it's something that we suppose, right? But here we've got some data that would have been really rare to happen. So if that's the case, we say, you know what, it's not even plausible that the null could be right, because if it was, we shouldn't have seen these data. But we did. So we reject the null as a plausible model, which, of course, leaves us with support for the only other alternative, that is H1. Now, if you're worried about, you know, getting all those steps down, especially in R, remember, this is just a conceptual way to perform the hypothesis test. R will actually do it directly, right? So let me show you how this works, okay? It's called the binomial test, and the function in R is binom.test. In fact, the syntax is pretty simple. You put in your observed data, you put in the number of trials, you put in the probability under the null, and then I had to specify the alternative was greater, otherwise it would have done a two-sided test, you know what that means. But when I put all that stuff in, and of course this is easy to change for whatever your context is, and I hit control return, it will give us over here all of those outputs. It'll tell us all kinds of things, and particularly, you'll notice it immediately gives us that p-value without with very little work. You, you've seen that number before. Is that 0.05? Okay. So performing one of these tests in R is actually quite simple. It has it has that function already built into it, and now because of what we did to walk up to it, you know exactly what this test is and what it's giving you. Okay, so let's finish up and let's go back to the Emily Rosa study and let's use R and the tools we've learned to answer our question. So remember, the therapeutic touch practitioner would have the experimenter's hand right over their left or right hand and they had to guess which one it was. And they were only correct on 44% of the trials. If you pull the JAMA paper, the, the Journal of the American Medical Association, it turned out that raw data was 123 out of 280 trials. So they only got it right 123 times. So let's set up our hypothesis test. Uh, same kind of test as before. The null hypothesis, if the practitioners are just guessing, right, then it's going to be W equals 0.5. It's a 50-50 shot. And if they're actually performing above chance and using this, this technique, uh, then the probability of each trial should be bigger than 0.5. So we want to see which one best, uh, best predicts our observed data. So we can use the binomial test. Let's go back to our studio. This time we'll change the data to 123 successes. Okay. We'll change the uh, length of the trials from 10 to 280. The rest of this will stay the same. Then we can just hit Control Return. And you'll see up here that the p-value is actually quite large, 0.9819. Okay. So what does that tell us? Well, that actually gives us something to end with today that will give you some good, um, some good hope for the next lecture. That means that the observed data were very plausible under the null hypothesis. What that means is there's no reason to reject the null hypothesis as a potential model for the data. So that's, you know, that's that's really quite interesting in this case. And I would say that, you know, we've probably got some things to do here, particularly when you consider that if you remember your, your, your basics of inferential statistics, if you reject the null, that means you've got, you know, an effect or, or some sort of thing that you're observing. But if you can't reject the null, you fail to reject the null, that actually doesn't tell you anything about the null hypothesis. This does not support the null either. And so whereas the Emily Rosa paper, they used this kind of result to say that the practitioners were not performing therapeutic touch, um, it actually doesn't work that way. It just means we haven't considered, you know, maybe we didn't get a big enough sample. We just can't reject the null yet. So if anything, these data just don't give us evidence of a real effect. They, they give us a picture that kind of looks like no different from guessing. 
So can we actually get support for the null? And the answer is yes, but not using classical inference. To do that, we're going to have to use Bayesian inference. And you'll see in the next lecture that we'll be able to do that and, and very crisply and concisely measure the evidence for either hypothesis, not just the alternative hypothesis. So that's all for today. Um, again, the, the basic idea is that we use models to link things we want to know about to the things we can see. And the problem of inference is we got things we can see and we want to use the model in reverse to make inference about the things we can't see, the stuff we want to know about. And so classical method is hypothesis testing as we just demonstrated with the uh, binomial test. We're going to learn about all kinds of tests this semester, but particularly we're going to learn how to do Bayesian versions of these. So that's in the next lecture. I look forward to it. I'll see you then. Uh, happy working on the problems that you get to work with with, uh, with binomial function. And let me know if you have questions. See you next time.